Good morning. We are on class 26. We're starting to look at coral reefs today. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Father God, we thank you so much for today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your protection. We thank you, Lord, for all the people that are uh, sacrificing to serve each other right now <clears throat> in this time of crisis for our nation um, with the coronavirus. And Lord, I'd ask that you would help us now as we do this class, bless each of the families that are represented that are watching, Lord, online. Please, Father, and please, Lord, help me to be a broken vessel that your light can shine through and be glorified as we look at the cool things that you made. Thank you, Lord. And please, Lord, help me to make these classes what you would have them to be. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, well, here I am again without you, and I really miss you. I just want you to know that uh, it's very difficult for me um, to do these things without you. Um, also, I want you to be aware of what's going on in my life right now because it does affect you. Once again, we're filming these because of the coronavirus and we can't be together. Um, <clears throat> on Monday, early in the morning, my husband, Steve, had a heart attack and he's awaiting open heart surgery, double bypass surgery. Um, and so this will be the last time today that I'll be able to film these classes for you because once he goes through that, then it's my intent on taking care of him, which apparently he's gonna need a lot of taking care of as well as taking care of my parents. So I'm gonna film two classes for you today and then the end of the class isn't going to be what we originally planned. It's going to have to be built from other film that I have um, already made because of my family situation. So I appreciate your understanding in that matter, and we uh, do appreciate your prayers. Um, on top of that, some of you are going to notice that I'm missing a tooth. And so on top of everything else, after we got my husband settled in the hospital, I noticed I had a bad toothache. And when I went into the dentist, he had to pull one of my front teeth and it had a bad abscess underneath it. And so I'm actually stitched up and um, they rebuilt the bone and everything. So I'm gonna do the best I can with you today. I'm on antibiotics and I'm doing the very best I can, but I don't wanna leave you guys in a lurch. So I'm gonna, uh, it, it may not be what it normally is. And if so, you'll understand why, but we're gonna get through this. I'll film these two classes today. And then the uh, classes after that will be pulled from other um, classes and events, so they probably aren't, I know they're not going to line up perfectly with your reading, but we're going to do the best we can because the Lord's got everything under control and we don't. <laughs> so, and I want you to know that I miss all of you desperately and I'm praying for you and um, I'm just so sorry that I didn't get to hug all of you one last time uh, before we had to separate because of the coronavirus. Um, but know that I, I love all of you and that I, I'm hugging you. And you guys that hug me know I'm hugging you. <laughs> so, okay, let's go ahead and do what we're doing today, which is coral reefs. And so in your Florida waters, we have started into chapter 7, which is found on page 99. And we also had some reading that we did um, from our marine biology coloring book. And so let's see, we are on class 26. So there's the stuff we're supposed to be doing. Okay, good. All right, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, once again, we're looking at sponge, rock, and reef communities today. And reef communities, in this case, we're, we're really looking more at coral reefs because we've already looked at the worm reefs when we did the uh, mineral-based, the estuaries, we looked at those. Um, and so <clears throat> remember, we've worked our way out from the uplands of Florida out to the edges and we are actually now in the water portion um, around Florida, which Florida has so much water involvement inside and outside of Florida. Remember that the estuaries can either be mineral-based, which has a loose, either loose sediments or uh, a solid bottom made of limestone. They can have underwater meadows, which we looked at, which were seagrass beds or algae beds and algal beds, excuse me. Um, and then the animal-based ones were mollusk reefs, which we looked at when we looked at the estuaries, worm reefs, which we also did when we did the estuaries. Remember estuaries being where the fresh water comes out into the salt water. Uh, but in this chapter, we're going to actually be looking at the sponge, rock, and coral um, reef communities. And so that's where we're going with today's class. Um, just a quick review, because this, the 
I like the colorful fish, and, and I think most of us do. And so we were learning uh, that the fish had different colors for different purposes. Uh, the sergeant major, I'm, I'm going to use local fish rather than the uh, California fish that he focused on. Uh, the sergeant major and the damselfish both use their colors to actually advertise territory, that this is their territory and they're not going to share with others from there. Um, we saw that the lionfish, actually his colors warn other fish that he is venomous. So it's a warning. And then we saw that the coloration can actually help determine whether it's a juvenile or an adult. So that not only are their feeding patterns different, but then they know for mating purposes that they're still a juvenile or it's an adult. So it can actually uh, distinguish socially what's going on and facilitates bonding in mating pairs. And then this is our um, queen angel and that shows again the juvenile is colored very differently than the adult for the same reasons and then we saw that um, the butterfly fish actually is camoed with what looks like an eye back here so that predators as they go for that eye the fish boogies off in this direction so that he gets out of the way and escapes. That's the idea. And then we looked at countershading, countershading being where it's dark over the top, light over the bottom, so that if you're in the water below this fish looking up, the white or silver bottom blends in with the sky above. And, and if you are looking down at the fish, let's say from a boat, and you're looking down at him from the top of the water, then the darkness makes him blend in to everything underneath him. And therefore, the counter shading is a very good form of shading, particularly for what are called pelagic, uh, pelagic fish. And we haven't hit that term yet, but you've probably seen it in your reading in your um, in your marine biology coloring book already. Pelagic is referring to open water. And um, one of the things I saw made the distinction that it's not just open water, it's open water and it's not over the continental shelf. But in general, if you say pelagic, just think open water. So in other words, it's not a fish that lives on the bottom or is associated with the bottom for a large portion of its life. Um, if it's pelagic, then that means that it's doing swimming in the open water. And so this would be the kind of thing that you would see more frequently in pelagic fish because that's where it would work. Whereas a bottom dweller, which we said was benthic, right? Uh, a bottom dweller would be camouflaged a different way. This wouldn't work for them, would it? But this works very well for pelagic uh, creatures. So, um, and then I'm just showing you that is the counter shading. You see that in, I'm pretty sure that's a marlin. And then there is disruptive coloration, and that's where um, they tend to blend in with whatever environment that they happen to live in. And the example was the clownfish. And then aggressive mimicry, and we actually come across that again in other lessons. And I looked it up because I was trying to figure out, I didn't think the book really explained what it was very well. And apparently aggressive mimicry is when their body shape um, actually is a form of camo. So in the case of the stonefish, his body is actually shaped like the stones on the bottom. And I know we read about another fish, I'm pretty sure it was the frogfish that had a little lure on the front of its head to, you know, get whatever he wants to eat close to him with his lure and then he, he eats them. Um, that was considered aggressive mimicry too uh, in the reading. So I just wanted to mention that because I found it a little confusing. We saw that uh, there were two different ways that the colors could change in marine life. They could be from iridocytes, which were mirrors, basically, and they usually are uh, associated with silvers and white colors and the light blue and the light greens. Uh, so that would be the iridocytes. And then all the really dramatic colors that we see come from chromatophores. I remember the chromatophores, and, and they're not all in the same level necessarily. There can be different levels uh, as to what colors and pigments there are in the different levels of their skin because we have more than one layer of skin. And so as these chromatophores open, then, and they extend the, the pigment out through the cell, then you see them more, more quickly. Whereas if they want to be less colorful, then they will shrink those cells and those pigments will shrink up and then it's not as obvious. So those are chromatophores. And chromo actually means color. And four, P-H-O-R, means bearer. Chromatophores. Okay, here you go. 
So this means bearer and this means color. So chromatophores are color bearers if you were to break the word down. So that is the pigmented cells that we're talking about. Okay, so that's how they get their color. And then the, we looked at some symbiotic relationships last week and we saw that like this particular um, sea slug, I'm pretty sure its name was Alicia, Elisha or Alicia. But anyway, this particular sea slug, it actually takes on the color of the algae that it eats, <laughs> which is pretty interesting if you think about it. And zooxanthellae was the algae that is in the tissues of many sea creatures, including corals and coral reefs, um, but also in other creatures like the giant clam um, that was discussed that's found in the Pacific. This is, these colors are actually from the zooxanthellae and it gets in the tissue of these individuals. Remember the zooxanthellae is a single celled algae um, and it's actually the, the coloring book tells us that it is a uh, modified dinoflagellate, which I know most of you are thinking, what does that mean? But if uh, you've already had biology, you already learned that dinoflagellates terrible flagella that they are usually associated with red tide so they're organisms within that grouping but these obviously aren't red tide organisms um, no actually zooxanthellae is a very very important uh, symbiote within the marine community symbiote being a symbiotic relationship the mutualism because remember this algae functions like a plant so it takes in the sunlight uses photosynthesis to produce sugars and food and produce oxygen and then it gives that to the organism that it's living inside of its tissues and then what it gets from the organism is the waste products of the organism cells actually uh, provide the other things that the algae needs to make the food that they do. So the algae gets a home and the um, whoever it's living in the tissues of gets the benefit of the food that it produces, which is very important in coral and we'll come back to that. And so this is showing you the zooxanthellae and this is actually in coral polyps, but this is showing you the zooxanthellae close up so that you could actually see that. And then we looked at cleaning stations, which are cool, and we saw that there's places on the reef that different animals will go fish. Um, I guess they're all, nope, they're not all fish because uh, turtles are reptiles and manatees go to cleaning stations too and they're mammals. So there's all sorts of marine critters that go to these cleaning stations to get cleaned because the little fish and the, and the uh, shrimp and stuff that actually do this cleaning are actually helping these or organisms to survive because they might be removing things like um, like parasites and stuff that are on the back of them. Uh, so they, they are, uh, are getting extra food out of their teeth so that their teeth don't rot away and then they starve to death. So there's there are real uh, good need for these cleaning stations and um, there's all sorts of critters that benefit from them. So we talked about that and actually in this week's reading we saw that uh, sometimes the color of the individual will be what tells the other individuals this is a cleaning station, I'm brightly colored, this is my cleaning station, come be cleaned. And so um, the services rendered advertising is the color also. And then we looked at the symbiotic relationship last week between the sea anemone and the clownfish and how they help one another. Uh, that the sea anemone uh, provides protection for the clownfish and the clownfish kind of draws in the food for the sea anemone as it comes in to try to get them. So uh, there's a mutualistic relationship there. And then we saw that the sea anemone can actually uh, ride on the hermit crab and that the uh, crab benefits from the protection of the sea anemone and the sea anemone benefits because he gets to get a lot more mobility than he would have otherwise. So that's very helpful for them. And we saw another symbiotic relationship with the stingray and the bar jack that the, um, as the stingray brings up, remember they eat crustaceans and things, uh, mollusks, things that are in the sand. So as it gets stuff up with its fins, the pectoral fins, as it makes stuff come up so that it can eat it, some of the stuff that comes up uh, the jack eats, so he benefits from the ray. I think this is commensalism, though. I don't know that the ray helps the, excuse me, that the jack helps the ray, but I know that the ray helps the jack. So when it only goes one way and nobody's being harmed, remember that's a form of commensalism rather than mutualism. And this also was an example of commensalism where we had in the starfish within its uh, umbilical 
grooves, it actually has some polychaetes living there and they just benefit from whatever food is left over from the feeding of the starfish. So they're not helping the starfish, but they're not hurting the starfish and they're benefiting. Therefore, that would be a commensalism situation also, that type of symbiotic relationship. Once again, when the host is being harmed, which is the case with parasites, then it is a parasitic symbiotic relationship. These would be ectoparasites, which are on the outside of the body. These were just some representatives of some endoparasites, which would be found inside marine critters that they have infected. And once again, parasites take away the life from the host slowly but surely, so eventually the host will be either sick or dead because of the parasite. Uh, and then these were polychaetes, which we said were segmented worms, and they have these really cool little uh, setae on them, and uh, which I always think of setae, and just in case you're wondering how that's spelled, and where you'll see that again, if you haven't had biology already, that's what they call the little bristles on the bottom of a, an earthworm, how it moves, because they too are in phylum Annelida, which is segmented worms. Um, so the CTA is, I think of it as worm bristles. <laughs> so, because that's what it is here and that's what it is on the earthworm. So that's how I would define the CTA as worm bristles. So the uh, polychaetes have the little CTA and some of them can be very pretty. And then last week we looked at um, a lasmo branch, which I called chondrichthys, uh, because I call the bony fish osteichthys, and so the um, cartilaginous fish would be chondrichthys. And we said that the three types of fish that were classified here are sharks, rays, and skates. And remember the difference between a ray and a skate, usually the, the clicky difference is that a ray will have a thinner, skinnier tail like this, whereas a skate will have a heavier, fleshier tail, like you know you see here. And that's why I got a little confused last week with the electric ray, because his tail looked kind of fleshy to me. I'd have thought he was a skate, but it said that he was a ray. So, but that's a general rule of thumb, it's not perfect. But if it's got a fleshy little tail, usually a skate. If it's got a long, whip-like tail, then we would call it a ray. Um, let's see. So then there's your southern stingray, and we had some examples of those. We went through and saw how, because of their association with the bottom, remember they're kind of benthic, they, uh, well, some of them, not all of them, but like the manta ray, he, he's definitely plagic, he swims because he's a plankton eater. But these guys, these, these uh, stingrays that are on the bottom, they're benthic and they're part of the benthic community. And because of that, they don't want to be pulling the water into their gills from underneath here, because if so, they're going to get a lot of dirt in their gills and that wouldn't work very well at all. And so I know you guys have at some point, I know I have all the time, been having a drink and you breathe some of the drink instead of swallowing it like you were supposed to or you breathe some of your food instead of swallowing it like you were supposed to and you cough, cough, cough trying to get it out because it, your body's like, no, nothing like that's supposed to be in here. Only air is supposed to come down these tubes. And so then you end up coughing like crazy. Well, that's kind of the Ray's situation. And so God took care of that because think about it. If he was getting his air from underneath, he'd be pulling in all that sand. So God worked it out so that they pull the water in for their gills behind their eye. And we called those spiracles. And so the water comes in here and then the water goes out on the bottom. And here we had five gill slits on each side. So 10 in all. So the water goes in through the spiracles on the top and then comes out through the gill slits on the bottom and that's how they breathe. And then they have a mouth on the ventral side of their body also. Um, that is our manta ray. Once again, a filter feeder. They can get very, very large and they're very beautiful actually. Um, and that was our um, sawfish, which has kind of like a shark body, but he's got kind of a ray thing going on um, up here with his pectoral fins. So, um, and that's his underside. Once again, you see the five gill slits. So you can see the ray similarities here with his mouth and the gill slits, okay? Um, but this guy does swim, so it, it appears that his spiracles are up here. Let's see. Nope, nope, he's got spiracles there, okay? So the water comes in through the top, goes out through the bottom here too. I'm just trying to figure out, I, I, he must use these. Um, some people will call them nostrils. Usually within marine animals, when they have nostrils, uh, 
like with sharks, they're called nares, N-A-R-E-S, nares. So I would say maybe those are nares. And if you're thinking, well, what does a shark <laughs> need nostrils for? For the sense of smell. Uh, they're not breathing through them, they're smelling through them, and they do have a good sense of smell. So that would explain why we see uh, the nares. Um, and then these were our spotted eagle rays, which are absolutely beautiful, and they're frequently seen in pairs. Ah, that's that little electric ray I was telling you about. And see how fleshy his tail is? See, Ida said that that was a skate because he's got a really thick, fleshy tail. But we were told that that is an electric ray. So I guess the tail thing by itself doesn't always work. Um, I know there's differences in how they uh, bear their young also, but let's be honest, that's not something you're going to be able to look at it and see. So uh, well, let's just use a rule of thumb. Remember in science, the rules of thumbs don't always apply, but they do sometime. And because remember, these are man-made designations. God just made all this cool stuff and we're trying to deal with how do we organize it. And so we'll just go by if it's got a long skinny tail, it's a ray. And if it's got a short fleshy tail, then we're going to call it a skate unless we know otherwise. And then we saw that there were three ways, and this is true of, of all critters, okay, as far as fish and uh, reptiles and mammals, and that they have one of these three forms of bearing their young. Um, I, I didn't go over with you, and in biology, uh, the students learned that there is also different forms of fertilization. In other words, when the egg and sperm come together, like in the case with fish, it's usually external fertilization, usually, not always, where they spawn. We've seen that, where they put the eggs into the water and then the sperm into the water, and then it comes together to make the zygote, which is the fertilized egg, and then it starts to grow. And depending on where it grows, um, that's how we determine the form of bearing that it is, how it's born. The other way is internal fertilization, and listen to the words, external happens outside of the body, internal happens inside of the body. That's where the female has the eggs and the male delivers the sperm to the female, and that that is, they come together, the egg and sperm come together within the animal. In the case of the crawfish, that would have been the case, and then she lays those eggs. And so once again, that brings us to this part. If they lay eggs and the baby grows and develops in an egg and then hatches out, it's called oviparous, ovi meaning egg and parus meaning to bear. So oviparous is egg born. So these little guys actually in eggs, there's a yolk that feeds the baby that gives it the nutrition while it's forming. And so these little guys actually hatched out of eggs. And that would be the case with birds and turtles. And so anything that lays an egg and the baby comes out of it is oviparous. We learned also, and there you go, that's a shark egg. Uh, I don't know if you've ever gone to SeaWorld and see one. They're very cool. And you can see the little shark in there breathing. Uh, but that's a shark egg. That's showing you his yolk. So he's very young still. He's got a lot of development. As he develops, that yolk will shrink because he's using the nutrients and the baby will continue to develop. But that's oviparous. And then if... The egg is kept inside the mother or the father in some way, uh, like with the seahorse. Remember the seahorse, the father kept the eggs in his pouch until they were ready and then they came out. That, where the egg is brooded internally in one of the parents until it's ready to hatch, and then when it hatches, it comes out alive. We call that ovoviviparous, and the reason is, is because it's live born from an egg. So ovo means egg, and viva means life. So ovoviviparous means live born from an egg. And this is just remi uh, reminding us that's a picture of a fish that's brooding his eggs in his mouth, or her. I can't remember which one does it on that one. And this shows you that the rays also can do um, the ovoviviparous birth, where they have live babies that are born from eggs that are kept internally until the babies are ready. And then the last type of bearing was viviparous, which means it's live born from a placenta. That would be the case with mammals. Um, we have our babies, they're attached. The placenta is actually the attachment between the mother's circulatory system and the baby's circulatory system. And that's why we have a belly button, okay, because the uh, Placenta and the umbilical cord actually attach the baby to the mother in the womb so that it can get nourished and grow and do gas exchange and waste exchange, etc. And so, uh, and we do see that even in some sharks, there is a viviparous type of bearing their young. So, um, very confusing in general as far as classification goes. Like in mammals, there's only two egg laying mammals, the rest of mammals are all um, viviparous. 
So, but there are two egg-legged mammals. There's the echidna, uh, the spiny echidna, and the uh, duck-billed platypus. So these are generalities, and God decided to use these, and we try to classify them, but it doesn't always work out just perfectly when we just try to put it all together like we want it to. Um, okay, and then let's see. Hey, we're finally up to today. So that was the review from last week. I know I didn't ask you questions today, but I hope you were right along with me there. All right, so we're getting to sponge, rock, and reef communities. And the colonial animals that our Florida waters told us about um, was that on these we have sponges, we have bryzoans, we have sea squirts, and we have corals. And those are the ones that we find colonial. So we'll mention all of these. We're gonna camp a little more on the sponges and the corals, but we'll run through all these. We've already kind of looked at sea squirts before. These are some different varieties of marine sponges. And I, please notice they come in all sorts of different shapes and colors and sizes. They can be very, very tiny. They can be very, very large. Um, and so what do they have in common that makes them sponges? Now, I haven't put it on here, but they are classified, for those of you that want to know, in phylum periphera, phylum being kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So phylum periphera. And the pore here is talking about the holes in the sponge because the sponges are full of holes. And the pores are another name, a synonym for holes. And so how the sponges work is this. <clears throat> the water goes into the holes in the sponge and then it goes out through the big hole that it has, usually at the top, or there's a bigger hole someplace, and that's called the osculum. And so, and the little holes that are going in are called the osti, let's see, this is osculum, so they're ostia, plural, ostium, singular, are the little holes going in. You don't have to know that, but I should tell you that though, because I'm your teacher. <laughs> anyway, so the water goes in and then comes out the top, and, um, in the process, the sponge is getting its food from the water. It's a filter feeder. And so if you look here, you can see the little holes where the water is pulled in, and then the bigger holes, the osculum, where the water goes out. And it's all over in the sponge. It's not a single entity. Um, how does it make the water move? Um, oh, before I get there. Um, sponges need to keep that water flowing for feeding purposes so that they can eat because once again, they're filter feeders, so they eat the stuff out of the water. Little pieces of organic material, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and just leftover pieces of things. So they need to keep the water moving around for feeding purposes so that they can pull those little pieces out of the water. They'll go through gas exchange where they'll get rid of the, the carbon dioxide and pull in oxygen from the water, so uh, oxygen in the water that's diffused down and is very important um, so that they can get rid of their waste. That's what excretion means. And they sometimes will use the flow of water for reproductive purposes. Sponges can bud where they just make a little copy of themselves that grows off. It's a form of cloning and it's called budding and it's asexual reproduction because there's not an egg and a sperm coming together. It's just one individual making a perfect copy of itself. So that's called budding and budding is a form of asexual reproduction. Asexual being only one individual is involved. So you're going to get a genetically perfect copy of whatever it is that made that budding, unless there's mutation involved. Um, then they also are able to go through spawning, which we, and it's broadcast spawning. We already talked about that, where they actually put the eggs and the sperm into the water and then they have to come together there. And this is a form of sexual reproduction because this actually has both the egg and the sperm coming together there. Okay? Okay, now, how do they get that water moving through there? Because that's where I was going before. Because, you know, how do they pull that water in and then push it up through the top? Well, it's really a good question. And how they do it is they have these little cells on the inside of, of the central cavity and they're called collar cells. And the collar cells actually have a little flagellum, like a tail, a flagellum, and then they have a collar around it that's made up of cilia. And we can think of cilia almost like little fingers, okay, only they don't have bone in them. <laughs> but they're little fingers and they can move like this. They've got stiff uh, cilia around that flagellum 
and actually that's where they catch their food but let's talk about how the flow goes first okay so these cilia will uh, excuse me the flagellum flagella plural will be be beating and in the process of doing that it pushes water out here well because it's pushing water out there it lowers the pressure so it pulls water into the sponge so literally their action pulls water into the sponge and then it goes out through the osculum they also have amoebocytes behind the collar cells and an amoeba Amoeba, when we look, if you look at protozoa, amoeba is something that's just got an irregular shape, okay? And so an amoeba site is a cell that has this basic shape. And the amoeba sites are in the sponge because they actually, they function as the circulatory system and the digestive system. So in other words, they help to digest the food and then they spread it out throughout the sponge. Then you also notice in this picture there's spicules. The spicules are little, you can kind of think of them as little pieces of bone within the sponge, although it doesn't have bones, it has spicules. Sponges have two things for their support. They have spongin, which is a Spongin, which is a protein that gives them support and strength. And then they have spicules, not all of them. Some sponges have spicules, some don't. And the way you can tell if you're holding a sponge, and hopefully you're not holding a live sponge, but if you find one on the beach after a storm or something, if you squeeze it and it feels spiky, it's got spicules. If you squeeze it and it feels soft, totally soft, like the one that you use when you wash your car or your horse or your body, then that sponge doesn't have spicules. It strictly has spongin. Okay. Okay, so the spicules, they can actually look at the spicules and determine what species of sponge you're looking at because the spicules will be different depending on which sponge it came out of. But this is just giving you an idea of what some of these spicules look like. And so the sponges can come in all sorts of different sizes and colors. If the sponge finds itself in a situation where the weather has gotten so cold that it's going to kill the sponge because the water's just too cold for it, they, will, they have the capacity to make a gemmule. And so in biology, they'll classify it along with um, the types of reproduction that we talked about before. But the gemmule is actually almost like a, um, well, it, it's a protective coating to wait till the, the time is right so it can start growing again. Suspended animation on sci-fi movies, they call it suspended animation, where they put them to sleep, where they take a long distance uh, flight for years and years and years in space, that kind of thing. Okay, that's kind of what this is, that when the sponge finds itself in a situation where it's not going to be able to survive, it will actually take some of its cells and put them in a ball of spicules, and it's called a gemmule, and the gemmule... The gemmule actually will be that little suspended animation thing that it will wait until the conditions are better and then it will start to grow into a sponge again. Now, um, let's see. Okay. So this is a close-up of the collar cell and it shows you the flagellum and then the cilia. Here they're called microvilli, but that's the cilia. And once again, they push the water away, which pulls the water in from um, the other things. Now, pulls the water in through the little holes in the sponge. Now, once the food comes through here, the food gets caught in this area, in the collar, which is the cilia or microvilli. And then the collar cell can either digest the food that it catches or the amoebocyte comes up behind it the amoebocyte comes up behind it and it also can digest the food. One way or another, the amoebocyte distributes the nutrients throughout the sponge because they can move around. Okay, now I wanted to show you this, so let's see if this is going to work. They might not look like they're doing much, but a simple demonstration shows how effectively sponges can pump water. On a reef in the Caribbean, I make a dive with a syringe filled with a non-toxic dye called fluorescein. By squirting it around the base of some sponges, we can observe how the water is moving by watching what the dye does. Within only seconds, isn't that the cool? Through the sponges along with the water, as you can see, a sponge. Look is pretty good how it pumps water. Drainer. 
Any plankton that goes in with the water won't come back out through the osculum. See, so they strain out the food, so they're actually cleaning the water. Even more spectacular to observe. They pump the dye so furiously that they look like a collection of miniature smokestacks. Isn't that neat? Wish we could go do that together. Anyway, I just really wanted to show you how the sponge pumps water, and I thought this was a very effective way for us to see it. <laughs> okay. The ultimate test is a happy oh. barrel sponge. What will a big monster like this do? It takes a few seconds for the dye to work its way through the sponge. Wait for it. <laughs> but then it pours out like smoke from a chimney. That's pretty good pumping from those tiny little collar cells. Sure is, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed it. I wanted you to see how that worked. So I, I just thought that was really neat. Once again, so the food particles that do get caught, so the sponge's job is to clean the water. That's its job, and it keeps the water clean. And so, well, it tries. And so the particles get caught in there and then they can be digested here in the main portion of the collar cell or they can be digested by the amoebocyte behind it. One way or another then that's carried by the amoebocyte to the other cells in the sponge. Okay, in a 24 hour period, you saw how fast the, the, the fluorescent dye came out of that sponge. In a 24 hour period, a sponge that's just two and a half inches square, okay, so a little sponge, can actually pump 20 liters, think about that, that is 10 two liter bottles, 20 liters of water every 24 hours, a little tiny sponge, 10 two liter bottles every 24 hours. That's incredible if you think about it. So these guys are just incredibly efficient filters and water pumps in the ocean. Um, they also have chemical defenses. Our book, Florida Waters, told us that the sponges actually do have a chemical defense where they produce, I'm on page 100, where they produce a, a sophisticated set of chemical weapon, weapons that are toxic molecules and they're inedible to the predators that might want to eat them. And so it protects itself with that. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but we saw that there was one little red nudibranch, uh, nudibranch that actually lives on red sponges to eat the toxic chemical so that other critters don't eat it. So I, I found that pretty interesting. So the, 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 the sponges actually do have a defense. They have a chemical defense mechanism. And then the other thing that we read was that if you take a sponge and you shred it into little tiny pieces and then put it back in the water, the sponge will actually come back together and form the whole sponge again, which that's kind of mind bending for me. I just thought that was a, a total trip. Once again, that's on page 100 and it says here, if you put the sponge through a shredder, it's right under sponges, that the cells can swim about separately, find, refine each other, and regroup themselves into a whole sponge again, something that no vertebrate could do, and that is the truth. So that's real interesting. Uh, the sponges are also able to be mobile. If they get themselves on the back of a hermit crab, then the sponge benefits from um, having the mobility that a normal sponge wouldn't have because sponges are sessile. In other words, they're attached. Um, but they can attach themselves to something that's mobile, and that's the case here. And then sponges can support and do support an entire community or ecosystem of animals that actually live inside the sponge. And our book went into that, how on, that was on page 102, how so many different little uh, bryozoas and hydroids and uh, uh, polychaetes and fish and other animals but actually live in or around the sponge and benefit from the sponge. Um, this is that little red sea slug I was telling you about, the nudibranch. And he, he is 
colored just like the red sponge that he lives on, but he literally eats the uh, sponge and gets the noxious chemicals that the sponge protects itself with. And then this guy benefits from that because if somebody eats him, they will get the toxic chemicals that came from the sponge. So they know not to. And that red color, once again, advertises, I'm toxic, don't eat me. So pretty cool when you think about it. Um, and then once again, I already mentioned that they can bud and you can see that process here where just, it's like a plant that's got new parts growing off of it. So it's, it's, but, but this is an animal. Remember, these are not plants, even though they can't just motor around, they're not plants because they do not make their own food. They're consumers. They have to consume somebody else. So it's a multicellular consumer. Therefore, even though it might look plant like it's not, it's definitely animals. And so they can bud, which is asexual reproduction, or and they can spawn. Now the spawning is sexual reproduction. So what will happen is that they will actually do broadcast spawning where they will release the sperm and then that sperm will come over to another sponge and it will fertilize the egg and then the egg turns that fertilized egg which is called the zygote and you'll hear me keep saying that but all a zygote is you can think of it as a fertilized egg okay so when the egg and sperm come together that means you and i were zygotes once my horse was a zygote once my dog my cat they were all zygotes once okay so once the egg and the sperm come together the larva forms and then that larva will be carried away to where it can get to a place where it's got a nice bottom to attach it itself to and then it will start to grow into an adult sponge and then at that point it can go through budding or it can go through sexual reproduction just depending on uh, its life cycle this is showing you a sponge during uh, a spawn and so they actually will broadcast spawn and if it's a nocturnal situation so you'll see it at night um, but they will broadcast spawn and how it doesn't get mixed up with other sponges and stuff is that each particular species has a specific time that it will release, uh, broadcast spawners will release at specific times, we already talked about this, based upon the moon, the length of day, so they actually have very specific times that each species will release it so that the egg and sperm come together on the specific species. Okay. Uh, let's see, them bryozoans were also mentioned in here, and they are over on page 104, figure 7-2. We have a really good picture, and um, bryozoan actually means moss animals. Bryozoan actually means moss animals. And so they look a little like moss, don't they? They're pretty small. Uh, they tend to be filter feeders so that they also are cleaning out the water for us so that the water quality is clearer, which is very, very important in areas where you want to have coral reefs. Um, and so that's your bryozoans. And then sea squirts were another uh, colonial animal. And we already talked about sea squirts, how they're little tunicates. Uh, and because they have like a little tunic, which is like a hard uh, leathery kind of a shirt. And uh, we said that the water comes in them and gets pushed out here. And they too actually filt out the food out of the water as they have the water go through them. But they do start in kind of a tadpole type stage. And then they will settle to the bottom and their internal organs will change. And they'll go through a metamorphosis, kind of like a butterfly from a caterpillar. They'll go through a metamorphosis and turn into the adult. And then they actually pull the water in through the top and then push it out through the side. Um, and it filters food out as it does pump the water, similar sort of to a sponge. So there's a lot of suspension and filter feeders that help to clean the water and keep the water clean that the Lord put out there. Then we get to phylum Nidaria. And whenever you see a C and then an N, you know that the C is silent. I'm not sure if I did this with you already, but I do this with the biology students. What's that word? Knife, that's right, what's this word? Night, okay, you don't pronounce the K in front of an N. You also do not pronounce the C in front of an N. So these are called nadarians. And phylum nadaria, uh, very specifically, they have one of two shapes. They either are shaped like a polyp, which a polyp is like a sea anemone. It's kind of like a tube of toilet paper with tentacles around the top, right? Or they have a medusa stage, which is a jellyfish 
type of shape. So they'll have one of these two shapes. If they have a polyp shape, then they tend to be attached to the bottom, and that would be your sea anemones and your corals particularly. If they have a medusa shape, they're free swimming, and that would be your jellyfish and things like that. All nadarians have a mouth with surrounded by tentacles. So in the case here, the mouth is inside all these tentacles. In the case here, the mouth is inside of all these tentacles. So they're either polyp-shaped, medusa-shaped, and actually some of them are both during their life cycle. Um, they all have tentacles around the mouth. They all have a tube-shaped gut inside of them where that food will go. And they all have little poison dart cells, which we call nematocysts. This is once again showing you the tentacles around the mouth in both cases. Now the nematocysts are in the tentacles. That's the little poison dart cells. And um, how they work, and it's like a poison dart only, or a harpoon on a string, because what happens is when something hits the trigger, and I just wanna say right now, that trigger can be a touch trigger like a gun, or it can be a chemical trigger, so it's a specific chemical that makes it trigger the nematocyst to release. Um, and so whatever, something stimulates the trigger so that the, the dart comes out and penetrates whatever it's trying to defend itself from or whatever it's trying to get as food to eat because a lot of uh, nadarians are predators. So they'll use this to stun their prey so that they can eat it or to defend themselves. So when they, that thing is the trigger is pulled, then they will shoot that in to either the prey or whoever they're trying to defend themselves from, and they'll shoot that toxin into that individual, and then that way um, that, that stinging occurs, and, and then get this, then it can be reused. It will take it and reel it back into the cell and reload it again. Talk about efficient, right? So this is a really cool thing, and these are called nematocysts. And there is, we talked about this before, because we talked about how certain um, aeolid nudibranches actually eat these, and then when they eat the tentacles, they, they get these, and then they reuse them for themselves. So they had another name, which was called the nidocyte. Um, and the nido, C-N-I, here, it says it right here, nidocyte. That is the other name for a nematocyst, okay? So it just depends on what textbook you're looking at. In the Apology of Biology, it will be named this way, and in some other textbooks I've seen it this way, so it just depends. But that's what it's talking about, poison dart cells. Okay, then <clears throat> we see that, <clears throat> excuse me, the sea anemone actually lives among those because it acclimatizes itself to the toxins apparently in the nematocysts of the uh, sea anemone, and it's, it's specific to a particular sea anemone, which I found rather interesting. Anyway, um, then we, and so sea, uh, sea anemones are a nadarian, definitely. So are hydras, which you're gonna be looking at with me under the microscope today. These guys are tiny, tiny, tiny. The, the, you, know, you can see them, they're macroscopic, but they're tiny. And it got a shape that's kind of like a small uh, sea anemone, don't they? Where they have a basal disc where they attach down to the bottom, um, and then they have a mouth with tentacles around it. They have a bump, and on the bump, they actually have what's called gonads, gonads being reproductive organs, generally. So the male would have testes and the, the female would have ovaries, the, the testes pr producing sperm and the ovaries producing eggs. But in general, oh, I should have put an S there, sorry. In general, they are gonads. You know how hard this is for me to spell without you guys here to help me make sure I'm spelling it correctly? You, you guys don't realize how much I need you to do a good job. I need you. Anyway, and so, so the bump could be the gonad, and then they do do sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. So the gonads would be producing the egg or sperm so that they can come together and make a new hydra, or they can go through asexual budding where it just grows a new one right off the side of it, no new information, so it's a clone of the parent. So they can do budding also. So that's the hydra. Oh, and one other thing, and I couldn't find a picture. These guys can move by somersaulting. So in other words, if the hydra wants to go someplace, and let's say he's right here, okay, he will actually bend over and he will somersault until he gets to a new place. 
Isn't that interesting? And I could not find a picture of it, and I'm sorry. So I just wanted to show you that that's how they move. So they're pretty cool. Little bitty guys, though. Okay, and then that's a hydroid. And the hydroid uh, was also an Adarian. Um, and I'm just, let's see, I'm oh, plate 23. So that would be in our coloring book. So I'm going to go to plate 23. There it is. Okay, and on plate 23, if you've got your book with you, on plate 23, you see the hydroid on the bottom right of that page. Um, and so the hydroid's interesting because they have both the medusa and the polyp stage and in the reproduction, and so do jellyfish for that matter. Here's the reproduction in the hydroid, and notice that the little medusas come off of what this would be more of a polyp, and then the little medusas come off of there. They go through sexual reproduction, so one makes an egg, one makes a sperm, turns into a zygote, and then it turns into a larva, okay, which in some of these is called planula, but not here, and then it attaches to the bottom and it grows into a polyp. But then the polyp will actually uh, bud little um, medusas that will be released and then it goes through sexual reproduction. Now, interestingly, because I don't know about you, but I thought, wow, that's a really complicated um, way to reproduce, but this is, apparently more than one type of nadirian goes through this because it's just like that with jellyfish. Jellyfish in the medusa stage will release an egg and a sperm. Uh, they'll come together and make the larva. The larva settles to the bottom and it turns into a polyp. Jellyfish have a polyp stage. The first time I learned that, I was like, wow. Um, so they turn into a polyp and then the polyp will actually go through reproducing little medusas by budding asexually, and then those little medusas will be set free, and that will be the life cycle of the jellyfish. Now, being from South Florida, I've been in the water when these things were released, and I've seen the water just full of baby jellies, and the best thing you can do is just get out because there's so many of them. And that's only at certain times a year because that's when they're reproducing. But this explained a lot to me because I've seen the water like this before and I could never figure out why they were all there all at once. Well, what happened is they were being released at that time from this stage. So, and we actually read about that on plate 76. So let's turn there for just a minute. Uh, on page 76, yeah, on page 76, this is reproduction or the life cycle of nadarians, and it shows you there this type of life cycle that we just looked at with both of these, okay, are on that page. Um, and so they both, in the medusa stage, are going through sexual reproduction, and then in the polyp stage, they're going through asexual reproduction, but they go through both in their life cycle, which is pretty neat when you think about it. And then the last thing on that page, on plate 76, was a particular type of sea anemone that when it's seen, it always seems to have its babies right around the base of it. So a lot of people thought they were uh, reproducing by budding, but then it actually tells on page 76 at the very end of the written portion about Dr. Daphne Fonten. Um, she studied this and figured out that actually the zygotes were actually being brooded in the gut of the sea anemone. And that after they were ready and had grown up enough, then they would come out. So if they're being brooded internally, it sounds to me like maybe it's ovoviviparous, where they're brooding it inside until it's ready and then it comes out live. So that would be uh, live born from an egg. That's kind of what I think you've got going on here. So they sexually reproduce, the baby's brooded in the gut, then they exit through the mouth, go to the base of the individual, and then when they're ready, they will move away from the parent and live an independent life. So thought that was pretty cool. All right, then we get to corals. And corals, um, and I'm going to turn, there we go, corals in their ken. So I'm on page 104 now, back in Florida's waters. Um, and Corals come in all sorts of shapes, colors, sizes. There's hard corals, there's soft corals. And in case you're wondering, what do you mean there's soft corals? Well, <laughs> corals are just a little critter, a uh, little tiny polyp, nadarian, okay? And there's all sorts of different ones. If it makes a stony skeleton so that it leaves rock behind, then it is a hard coral. If it's one of these or these, this is a sea feather, this is a sea whip, and you've probably seen sea fans before, those too are corals, but those are soft corals. And so they too have uh, the little polyps, but they don't make the calcium carbonate or the really hard um, 
structure or skeleton to live in. And so that would be a soft coral. So your soft corals, once again, and this is a picture from Dry Tortugas National Park, which is just past uh, Key West. I think it's 100 miles or less past Key West. And, and it, it was a fort, um, a US fort. And then now it's a place where it's a sanctuary. So you can go out there and you can skin dive and stuff. Um, anyway, uh, and so this is showing you some of these soft corals. And if you look closely, you can actually see the polyps. I like to do that. When I'm snorkeling, I like to dive down near the soft corals and look at the polyps because frequently they'll be out in the daytime when I'm snorkeling. I don't snorkel at night. I'm not, you know, that's when sharks feed. There's no way. I don't want to do that. But in the daytime, these guys will be feeding and I can get down close to them and look at their little polyps. Now, most corals are nocturnal, which remember that means that they come out at night to feed. Um, but like I said, these soft corals, I've seen the polyps out on those in the daytime. And then the other soft coral example would be your sea fan, which I already mentioned to you, and they can be very beautiful. These are some of the polyps, close-ups of some of the polyps on the soft corals. Now, hard corals, once again, are the ones that make the coral rock, what we think of here in Florida as coral rock. And, and they're also sometimes called stony corals. Once again, if you look closely, you will see the polyps, that they are still corals. They are still made up of a polyp with tentacles around the mouth, with uh, nematocysts in the tentacles to get, the, you know, corals are actually a predator, which is kind of hard to believe. But they don't have to catch too much food because they have a relationship with the zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae makes like 90% of their food, but they do still have to catch some of their food. This is a star coral, and this was mentioned in your book, and I can almost see the star shape and the polyps, and this is a close-up of those polyps in a star coral. But a star coral is apparently like a, a bigger, more of a boulder type coral shape. Um, and this also shows you some of the polyps on some corals. Um, these are the coralites. And I was walking over to my daughter's last night to get my lab stuff because I keep it over there in my shed. And this was just um, on the ground, but this is coral rock. And so I want to show you, you can actually see the lines in the, the coral. There we go. Okay, good. There you go. So here's the coral. And you can see the holes where the little polyps lived. And... You can see where the lines where they built one on top of the other, and I'll use the flashlight over here. You can see the lines where they built one on top of the other right there. So each of these little cups is called a coralite, and the polyp lives in there, and he'll pull in at night, excuse me, in the daytime, and come out at night and feed, and he excretes the little polyp, the, the individual coral excretes. Um, so kind of like we excrete sweat, okay? So it excretes calcium carbonate, which turns into this hard skeleton. And then as one coral dies and the next one builds on top of it, those were those lines I just showed you in the rock. That shows you where one polyp built on top of another polyp, and that's actually how um, these form, okay, into these big reefs and all the beautiful coral rocks that we think of um, that make them up. Now, zooxanthellae has a very important role in the life of coral. And just want to see here if I'm missing anything. Hang on just a sec. I, I don't know if I told you this yet. Corals require clear, warm water that is nutrient poor. Clear, warm water. And I know what it is. It's in the next class because we're going to do coral reefs then. But they need the clear water because they have the zooxanthellae in their tissues. And that zooxanthellae, once again, has to have sunlight so it can make the food. And it, it pr provides 90% of the food that the coral needs. And it also gives it the energy and nutrients that it needs to be able to um, secrete the calcium carbonate so that it can make its hard uh, skeleton. So the zooxanthellae are very, very important. You guys try to say that with me. Zoxanthellae. Zoxanthellae. There you go. It's not that hard. It looks weird, doesn't it? Zoxanthellae. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So once again, the zooxanthellae are those little algae that live inside of the tissues. They can make up over a third of the tissues of the coral. So they're considered part of the coral, even though it's a separate in, uh, organism. The algae gets a place to live, and it also uses the coral's metabolic waste, so like it's the CO2 it exhales and the nitrogen in its waste, so that it can do what it needs to to make food. The coral actually provides oxygen for the algae. The coral gets 90%, oh, and it provides a home for the algae. The coral gets 90% of its food from the algae, and the, the algae helps it to make the calcium carbonate that it needs to secrete to make its coralite cups so that it can make the rock that it's going to produce. And then in your reading, we talked about it the other day that the Elkhorn cor uh, coral has smaller polyps um, full of zooxanthellae, whereas the brain coral has larger polyps, so it actually, uh, from what I understand, it's more efficient at trapping the zooxanthellae because of its density. It's so thick. And then this shows you the polyps of a coral actually grabbing zooplankton. So it does still, it is a predator. It still does benefit from um, feeding on zooplankton and phytoplankton, but it does get 90% of its food from the algae, the zooxanthellae that lives right within its tissues. And once again, you can see it there. And it actually is what gives the uh, corals its color, which is cool. Um, corals have another form of feeding where uh, you read about it, where they can actually produce filaments, and then those filaments um, are gut filaments, and then they will actually grab the prey and pull it back in. I personally have never seen the filaments out on a coral. It probably only happens at night, and like I said, I don't scuba dive or, or snorkel at night. The other thing corals do is they produce mucus, and I've never seen this personally. Um, but they produce mucus, and the reason they do that is so that pollutants and sediments and things that would cause harm to the coral can be caught in that mucus and then that mucus can be released so that it, that way the coral can get it away from it. Also, there are mucus eaters on the uh, reef that benefit from this because they'll actually eat that mucus um, when it, it comes off of the coral. So uh, that was an interesting sidebar also. And then in your textbook, and it was on page 106, there you go. On page 106, on the left-hand side, it shows you the polyps of a staghorn coral um, and seated in their limestone cups. And that is what the staghorn coral looks like if you're backing away from it and seeing the coral. Um, okay, there it is. Corals need warm, clear, nutrient-poor water to survive. I thought it was in here somewhere. Warm. Uh, the book said it has to be 68 degrees or above, Fahrenheit. 68 degrees Fahrenheit or above. Now, when you consider the average temperature of the Earth's oceans is around 38 degrees, that's like 30 degrees cooler than what coral reefs need, then you can see why the coral reefs only grow in tropical areas because they've got, they've got to have warmer water than what's found in most of the oceans. They also need it to be clear so that the sunlight can get to the zooxanthellae. So that means all these filter feeders are very important to the coral reef so that the corals can survive because the sponges and the sea squirts and the bryzoans, all of them are very busy cleaning up the water so that it remains clear so that, and sediments mess things up too, remember. So they need clear water so that the uh, sunlight can get to the zooxanthellae and they need nutrient poor water. Now think about this. Nutrients we're talking about, you can always think of it as fertilizer, okay? And they need the water to not have fertilizer in it, the nutrients. Why? Because if there is too many nutrients in the water, then the algae that compete with the coral will overgrow and kill the corals. And so there's a picture. That is what was a coral reef that has now been totally overgrown with algae. The coral is all dead because this algae has overgrown it. And the algae, the algae's having a little party. Remember we learned about algal blooms when we studied Lake Okeechobee and lakes and stuff like that, where when there were too many nutrients, it, it messed up the chemistry in the lake and it caused eutrophication, which caused the lake to die. Well, that's what you see, the same kind of thing going on here where there's too many nutrients in the water. And so the algae's like, woohoo, party, 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 because it's got all the food it needs. And so it grows all over and it just kills the corals. 
So this is a very serious problem. I've seen reefs that look like this, and it just, they're destroyed, they're dying. And it's because too many nutrients. And if any of you are asking where do those nutrients come from, they actually come off of our yards and our lawns. And as we uh, put fertilizer and stuff on our lawns, and as we have farms that have the runoff coming into the water, then that water uh, flows down through the Everglades. And if it's not cleaned up in the Everglades, which it frequently can't be quickly enough, then it gets out into the keys and then it starts to destroy everything. So the nutrient load is very important and we will come back to that in a later class. Okay, then we read in the, um, that was as far as you were supposed to read in your, um, in your Florida's waters for today, which was on page 106. Then we get to plate 66, because you guys read that. And that is uh, color in marine invertebrates. So before we looked at the vertebrates, because we looked at fish, now we're looking at invertebrates. And these are advertisers. And once again, this peppermint shrimp is very colorful because he's advertising that he is a cleaner shrimp. So he's a cleaning station. And if a fish comes to him, then he will clean the fish. So his color is used for that purpose, cuttlefish. <laughs> Okay, these are cuttlefish, and they're classified as cephalopods, cephalo, head, pod, foot, head, foot, cephalopods are octopus, um, sea nautilus, cuttlefish, and squid, okay, head, foot, because their head and their foot are attached, aren't they? Anyway, um, these are cuttlefish, they don't live here. Uh, they live in the Pacific, but they are very cool. They can get up to about three feet long, which I don't know about you, but something that size would scare me to death if I was on the reef and saw something that looked like that. But it's not just that. I know that they're predators, and they are a real stealthy predator. Um, they have chromatophores like other cephalopods, so like squid and like octopus, and they can change their colors very quickly. Now, the book was talking about courtship rituals and how they will change colors when they're uh, courting to find a mate. But the book also says that they use dazzle coloration. I know you didn't read this, and if you want to go back and read it, you can, but this is so cool, I just wanted to show you. Then the one on the far left was warning colors, which we did do. But let me show you this. Okay, so I just had to show you that because these guys are amazing. Um, they do have, uh, as you see there, two grabber tentacles that they grab with and they dazzle the fish with their coloration, which is what you were looking at there, where they actually are changing colors and they're rippling the colors through. Almost looks like a strobe light to me, but they're rippling the colors through so that they hypnotize their prey and then they grab them and eat them. And then they also are very good at changing their color so that they're camoed and they can hide. So cuttlefish are a trip. Anyway, and then this is from plate 66 also, and it's the warning coloration that when critters have these bright colors frequently, and this includes those weird little uh, South American frogs that have all the bright colors, frequently this is warning uh, individuals that this guy is venomous. And remember, these guys can eat the nematocysts or the nidocytes out of the tentacles of other critters and then reuse them. So they definitely um, uh, need to warn that they have the noxious, uh, noxious chemicals in them, just like the red in the um, Nuda branch that lived on the red sponge is eating the noxious chemicals out of the sponge and therefore um, this coloration tells, well it tells, in this case it warns individuals. In this case it's actually camo, isn't it? So that's a mimicking the coloration. But in, in the bright colors it's a warning and here it's actually camoed for where it lives. And that's on page 67. So if you just turn the page, plate 67, you see that uh, that nudibranch is actually, the red nudibranch actually lives on the red sponge because it mimics its color. To the right of that, you saw that there are isopods that if they're living on the red algae, they look red. And if they're living on grass, they look green. So they actually take on the color of whatever they're, they're living on, therefore they're camoed. So the mimic, which is to copy, works out very well for them. And then the barnacles, you saw the stalked, stalked barnacles um, act with the limpet, and the limpet actually has lines on it and coloration so that it hides well. So the mimicry helps it to be camouflaged, which is what I see the mimicry doing. And then the last one it mentioned there was the decorator crab, and he actually puts plants on himself to um, 
camo himself, so he walks around with all these plants hanging off of him. So that's, that's pretty cool. I understand why they named that the decorator crap. Okay, so let's get to our lab. Uh, our lab today, we'll be looking at the hydra, and you'll be drawing the hydra. You'll draw its polyp body, and then I'll tell you what I'm going to want you to do. I'm going to give you the basics, okay? Down here, it has a basal disc. And then here it has its tentacles, so you'll identify that. Ten tentacles. And let's see, its mouth would be in this area. And we're supposed to see one that's budding, so that you would draw that and you would put that that is its bud. Okay. Um, I think, and then please go ahead and write that this is a hydra when you draw it, okay? Um, so we'll look at that under the microscope. We're gonna look at spicules, but the spicules that we buy when we get the slides don't look like this. They look more like this, <laughs> okay? And so um, they can either have three points to them or what they look like is little clear bones. That's what I tell the biology students when they have to look at spicules. I say, look for little clear bones, little piles of little clear bones. So we'll look at that. And remember the spicules are part of the skeletal system of certain sponges. Um, and then I'm gonna try to show you an amoeba under the microscope, just so you can see the shape of an amoeba site. Um, and I may as well, and then I'm going to show you a couple of examples of marine sponges that I have only because after a really bad storm, uh, one night when I stayed in Delray beach with my brother, um, I walked down to the beach the next morning and there were these dead, uh, sponges all over the beach. So I grabbed them and I've been using them ever since to instruct students with them. Um, so I don't want you to think I went out and killed sponges. I didn't. I just got their dead remains and used them for school purposes. Anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and do our lab. So these are sponges. And you can see the central portion. You can see all the little holes. These are kind of spiky. I got another one. It's soft, but there's a spikiness to it if you grab it. And so these would have spongin and spicules in them. Um, I got a couple other examples here. This is one of those that looks kind of like a chimney, okay? And then this one's real spiky, all right? But once again, these are just skeletons of what's left of these. Here is an example of the coral, and you can see in it where the polyps uh, once lived. And these are just pieces of other dead coral. Okay, but once again, that's the rock that's left behind. And then this one, once again, shows you where the corals have grown one on top of the other. So why don't you draw that, uh, you know, not all of that, just a couple of pieces for your spicules and draw that for your hydra because my equipment, my good equipment is in Boca Raton, and I'm not there, so I am apparently unable to show you from the microscope, um, and I apologize, I tried. <laughs> so go ahead and draw it there, um, and draw the spicules as little bones, and that way you'll be able to finish your lab. You don't have to draw the amoeba, I just wanted to show it to you. Okay, you guys, stay safe, I miss you, have a blessed week.